Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, this is the first in a new series of conversations. I've been having lots of roundtables with various uh, folks around different issues like child care, education, health, and businesses through COVID. Uh, but right now, we're starting a conversation series with legislators and advocacy groups focusing on bills that have passed in this recent legislative session and some bills that are still pending uh, because the session is only suspended until August and then we're starting up again in late August. In the next couple of weeks, I'll be holding these conversations to dig deeper into the CARES money and economic development, housing, hazard pay, healthcare issues and more. But today our focus is gonna be on the climate and environmental legislation. And I'm really pleased to be joined by a couple of incredible, actually three incredible leaders on environmental issues in Montpelier. Uh, Lauren Hurl, she's the executive director of the Vermont Conservation Voters and Representative Sarah Copeland-Hansis of Bradford and Senator Chris Pearson of Chittenden County, who are co-chairs of the Climate Solutions Caucus. So I'd like to welcome you all. Thank you for being here. I, I um, want to remind those who are watching that participation in these conversations does not constitute an endorsement, uh, but I want to make sure you also know that if you have questions or thoughts, please post them in the comment section uh, on the Facebook page, and we will try to bring them up and address them uh, as quickly as we can. As many of you know, uh, I've long been an advocate for environmental legislation and climate crisis legislation. It's really at the core of a lot of my work, both politically and on my organic farm. And I know that these guests and many others have a really strong commitment to working for a climate future that's gonna help Vermonters thrive. Uh, we know that our ski industry, our maple industry, agriculture and tourism, all are part of our future. And so we need to tackle the climate crisis uh, and build our economy uh, at the same time. I'm gonna start by talking about the Global Warming Solutions Act. And I wanna have our guests talk about what's actually included in this, uh, describe it, and why the bill is important to the work that's happening around climate change and our environment. The bill just passed. I don't think yet that the governor has signed it, and we can get that update as well from, uh, from the folks. So I'm gonna start with uh, Representative Sarah Copenhansis, uh, chair of the, uh, co-chair of the Climate Solutions Caucus from the House side, and just ask, you know, what's, uh, what's included in the Global Warming Solutions Act? Thanks, David. I'm uh, happy to talk about this bill. Um, this bill is really our foundational priority uh, as a Climate Solutions Caucus, because essentially what it does is it takes, uh, takes our climate goals, aspirations, and puts them into statute as requirements. But more importantly, it sets up a system, um, a council that will help Vermont develop a plan to achieve those goals. Because um, if you don't have a plan, you're not going to get there. Um, the focus of the bill is also really about resiliency. And I think that that's something that resonates with Vermonters uh, right now during COVID because we have all recognized the challenges and the shortcomings of the economy, the way it works now, uh, everything that is uh, fundamentally and essentially important to us has been, uh, has been stressed and strained under the, the COVID shutdown. I think it's um, uh, well worth understanding that, um, that a climate catastrophe could have that effect as well. And so the lessons that we're learning now in terms of community resilience um, in the face of the COVID shutdown uh, really should be replicated um, in, in terms of climate resilience as well. Um, uh, who do we need to protect? Who do we need to uh, wrap, uh, wrap support and, uh, and independence and um, resilience around? Uh, and so this planning document uh, has passed, the policy has passed um, the House and then recently passed the Senate and I expect that one of the first things that we'll do when we get back into session in, in uh, August, late August, is to uh, concur with the policy changes that were made with the Senate. Um, and then the policy will be ready to move. Um, the challenge in that is, uh, is the funding that's required. And, um, and so I think that uh, maybe Pearson can talk a little bit more about, uh, about that aspect of it. Senator? Sure, I'd be happy to. And, and uh, I, I think it's worth saying that uh, the Global Warming Solutions Act passed both chambers with overwhelming votes, tripartisan votes uh, in the Senate of 30 members, there's 24 senators supported it. 
Uh, and it really is an exciting uh, framework to how are we going to meet the Paris goals in the short term and ultimately by 2050 be net zero. We're joining Massachusetts, Maine, and New York that have looked at similar provisions in recent years and also giving citizens a mechanism to hold us accountable, to hold state leaders, legislature, administrations in the future accountable uh, to meet those goals. If we don't meet those goals, this sets up a citizen right of action where citizens like, uh, like with the Clean Water Act, where citizens actually uh, took the state and federal government to court for uh, falling down on our obligation to clean up Lake Champlain and held our feet to the fire. There's a similar provision in this. This is not about tons of lawsuits. This is about using the courts to hold the state accountable. Nobody's getting rich if they bring a lawsuit forward, but they do have that accountability, which so far the state has not been able to deliver on similar goals, and so it was an important provision. Now we do have to pay for the setting up the structure. Good planning requires data, requires some people to help. Uh, it's not a lot of money, but the budget, budget challenge is very real right now given the economic and, and health crisis. So that will be uh, something we'll have to work hard on in August when we return as, as Sarah was saying. I'm confident we can get there given the robust votes in both chambers uh, to support the Global Warming Solutions Act, but I don't take anything for granted at this point. So uh, people who are watching who think this is a priority, please do reach out to candidates and legislators let them know that this is a priority for you too. And Lauren, um, how is all of this work uh, connected to all the climate and environmental goals and legislation that you and your organization and organizations you represent uh, have been looking at and working on in the bigger picture? Yeah, I mean, similar to how the Climate Solutions Caucus really considered the Global Warming Solutions Act a really foundational bill this year, um, the coalition that I work, which includes 30 plus members, low income advocates, affordable housing advocates, businesses, and many others really coming together. And, you know, to us, this is such a kind of foundational piece of what we need to do because for so long it's been a question of, you know, if we should act on climate and we've taken steps, but they just have not been of the scope and scale of action that we need. And so by really putting in place this planning process and this accountability, we think it will change the conversation to how we can take action. And we know that the solutions can put people to work, weatherizing homes, installing solar panels, doing you know, all these important things that at this moment, I think are more important than ever. Um, and so all of the other policies we're working on, we view as kind of lifted up by this and it kind of, it can show us better, you know, how do they all fit together to meet our climate commitments. Um, and just one other thing, you know, Sarah really mentioned the resilience, which is a core piece of the bill. Um, another piece, uh, there's subcommittees that are looking at things like racial, social, and economic justice to make sure that the way we do the transition really matters and that we're bringing people along and making this work for all Vermonters um, and also the economic benefits and how, again, that we can, um, you know, spur a green economy in the transition. So that's really where our focus has been. Thank you. I, uh, it's interesting as you talk about these broader issues and how to tie them all together. Uh, back in January, when the session started, it seems like it was years ago. I know we've all gone through quite a bit uh, in, in these last few months with COVID. There was a lot of conversation demanding from climate activists, youth activists, folks across different sectors like Lauren just talked about, really demanding that we act aggressively to address climate change. And then COVID struck. And can any of you maybe talk about how COVID-19 impacted climate legislation and other environmental priorities, and maybe a brief bit on how building out with potentially jobs and support for jobs in, the, in this climate crisis uh, and COVID crisis situation may help us build our way back to a stronger economy. And I don't know if anyone has a first jump in they want to do, but uh, you know, I'd like to see us invest in you know, renewable energy, small scale. I think there have been almost 500 or over 500 solar installation jobs lost in the last couple of years. Maybe some of you can address some of those opportunities if we invest in climate legislation, what it could do for jobs. Anybody wanna? Sure, I, 
I'm foolish enough to jump in, Dave. Um, thank you. I, I, I think one of the one of the realities of our handling and understanding of the COVID pandemic is, you know, suddenly Vermonters are are sort of saying, "Where does my toilet paper come from? You know, where does my lettuce and tomatoes come from? Where does my electricity?" come from. And so for those of us who've been trying to say we need to build more electricity, uh, small, diversified, renewable, decentralized electric generation here in Vermont, suddenly maybe the, the conversations have shifted so that we could say we better make sure our hospitals are powered locally so that we're not dependent on energy coming from Quebec or Massachusetts when the next crisis hits. So uh, similarly with our food supply, you know, we have Vermonters who are struggling with food security. And by the way, we should commit and make sure that we say clearly, no Vermonter should be going hungry in this crisis or any other. We also have farmers who are struggling to uh, keep their businesses afloat. How can those two things be true? That, that doesn't make sense. And so as we try to come out of the COVID pandemic, I hope that there are new strategies emerging that incidentally would be good for the climate crisis, right? Um, if you buy local food, you're not importing produce from California. That happens to be good for the climate, but it's really good for, for nutrition and it's good for our local economy. And similarly, if our energy production is more localized. So I think there are opportunities like that because people have started to ask these questions in a way that we haven't been broadly doing uh, when we suddenly are worried about supply chains coming into our grocery stores and, and beyond. Boy, this last year we put, uh, last two years we put uh, Senator Pearson on the Agriculture Committee and uh, look at what he comes up with. That's exciting. Uh, Sarah or Lauren, do you want to touch on that real quick? Uh, yeah, I'll jump in real quickly. Um, you know, I think that, that this, uh, this ties in a lot to what I was talking about with respect to resilience. Um, and community resilience. I think that the COVID shutdown um, has really given folks an opportunity to recognize how important it is to have, um, you know, safe, walkable communities where you can get your basic needs met. And, um, and the value of our Main Street businesses, I think, has really come home to folks when all of a sudden um, you know, it was harder to, uh, harder to do things, harder to find um, find uh, consumer goods, et cetera. And so as we look at investing in, um, in coming out of COVID, you know, I hope that we really recognize the value of having um, livable, walkable, bikeable communities um, and, uh, and, and invest in that as a way of um, uh, not only strengthening our, our Main Street businesses, but also um, meeting our climate goals. Thank you, yeah. Lauren, you wanna chime in or you want me to go to the next round? I can just add a couple quick thoughts. Um, kind of looking big picture, I think it's been really interesting to think about how kind of our community and our state and nation have responded to the COVID crisis. You know, having worked on climate change for many years, like thinking about a global issue that you need to listen to scientists and the importance of how listening to you know what we're being told are the problems and solutions has really been underscored um, knowing that the communities hurt first and worst by covid are the same communities that are hit first and worst by climate change and so seeing those impacts in this crisis and being able to you know better understand the kind of public health threat that we put to people with increased pollution and and other problems um, you know, but I also think it's been really encouraging how and inspiring how people have stepped up to address this. I mean, think of how much dramatic action people have taken to protect our neighbors and communities. And, you know, for a lot of years, it's been like, we can't ask too much of people too quickly, take it slow. Um, and I just feel kind of inspired that we can take on big challenges and we can take action and we know that Vermont's economy is going to be better off for it and our families will be healthier and all of these good things so you know I feel you know as much as this is such a hard time you know some optimism coming out of how we've been able to respond in Vermont to this crisis so just wanted to add that. Oh well, thank you. Uh, Senator Pearson I'm curious about renewable energy standards there's been conversations about them for years uh, we had 
higher standards and then maybe not as many we had incentives for people with installing renewable energy can you give a brief update on what's going on with renewable energy standards or or support for renewable energy opportunities for folks yeah so we uh a, a number of years ago set out standards as many states have that said that by 2032 vermont would get to 75 percent renewable in our grid uh, and it said 10 percent of that would be small local uh, production mostly solar uh, in practice this past year and and that's decent you know but it's not far enough uh, a lot of us wanted to go further in this year s267 which was the bill i was the lead sponsor of it had many sponsors um, actually did get out of the first committee senate finance uh, was on track to meet the deadline in the normal course of business uh, the so-called crossover deadline which is what the legislature operates under its own schedule um, and then the pandemic hit uh, that bill would have moved us to hundred percent renewable by 2030 and increased our small local production of up to 20 percent on a similar timeline um, it was controversial to some degree i mean a lot of our utilities are already planning to go to 100 percent. some of them are already there so that part wasn't too controversial but when you um, insist that utilities buy locally produced power uh, at smaller scale, which is important to have distributive energy, it's important for resilience, it's important to stimulate the local economy. That gets a little harder uh, for the utilities to swallow. They don't really like being told what they're going to have to buy. On the other hand, we're saying this resilience is really important. I would say that bill S-267 likely is a victim of the pandemic and is not going to finish this year. But we've learned a lot. Uh, we've learned some of what the utilities are concerned about and maybe ways to answer them while we continue to push the goal of a diversified, resilient grid. We, uh, everybody's talking about storage. There's some interesting, exciting storage opportunities coming online in the kingdom right now. So we're learning this is a fast evolving uh, industry and uh, sources of energy for Vermont. And it's really important that we control some of our own energy. Uh, we, there's no reason for us to export all of those dollars month after month, uh, year after year. We ought to claim some of that, create the jobs, uh, and create the resilience that comes along with it right here in Vermont. Thank you. Uh, Lauren, quick question on some other environmental legislation. Uh, there's been some progress made over the years. I remember a press conference in the past around toxics and kids' toys and some other things. Um, but there's been other bills lately about toxic chemicals and toxic substances. Can you give a, an update around what's going on with toxics and uh, kind of where we're at with that? Yeah, absolutely. So this year, the legislature has really continued, as you said, kind of many years of work looking at how we can better protect Vermonters from toxic chemicals. And part of that is ensuring people have clean, safe drinking water. Um, you know, as you remember a few years ago when people down in the Bennington area found toxic PFAS chemicals in their drinking water, it really kind of sparked a lot of exploration by the state of, you know, how did this happen and what can we do to better protect people? Um, and so we've really been working through a lot of policies in recent years to get a handle on that. Last year, requiring PFAS testing for all public water supplies and remediation. Um, and, you know, these PFAS chemicals, again, are these what they dubbed forever chemicals because they're the things used in um, Gore-Tex and Teflon, water resistant, um, grease proof. So they have these cool properties, but it turns out they cause cancer and other harm to human health and they stick around in our environment indefinitely. So huge problems. Um, and so one thing that the uh, legislature has been working on this year is trying to essentially turn off the tap of bringing more of these chemicals into the state. So, you know, we know once they come in, they are going to be here and cause problems when people are exposed to them or when they contaminate our water. So the Senate passed a bill unanimously um, that would uh, ban PFAS chemicals from food packaging, um, where again, it's used as like a grease resistant um, coating from carpets and rugs, where it's used as a stain repellent um, and from firefighting foam. Um, 
all of these products, there's safe alternatives that are cost competitive. So there's no need for us to be using these toxic, um, harmful chemicals. Um, so that bill has headed over to the house and they started testimony before the break, um, but we'll be kind of urging them to bring it back up um, and, and move it. It's been interesting because there have been some recent studies coming out also showing that the impacts of PFAS exposure actually make you more susceptible to COVID uh, because it suppresses immune system response. So we see a real tie into, you know, all of these things are related and how do we protect people's health and, and get ahead of this problem. So we'll be continuing to push for that bill. Thank you. And um, Sarah, I know you've been um, caring a lot about and working a lot on energy efficiency utilities. And there was some shift last year on how some energy efficiency utility money could be used to address some of the climate issues as well in a little broader context. Can you maybe talk about briefly what that was and then why it's important and how involvement in transportation and heating uh, can also have a positive impact on our climate goals and, and even potentially jobs, which is kind of the next question I'm gonna get into with everybody. Yeah, excellent. So um, I would love to talk with you a little bit about energy efficiency. Um, I think that uh, this will resonate most with folks if they think about the activities of Efficiency Vermont. Um, this is an organization that most Vermonters have seen um, tabling at community events, at fairs, at food um, markets. Uh, and, you know, this is the place where many Vermonters were able to access a lot of the electric efficiency, um, uh, not only incentives, but, but freebies and giveaways uh, that has helped us to level off the growth of our, uh, our electric consumption. And I, I think if we look at the idea of extending the, the activities of an organization like Efficiency Vermont into the heating and transportation realm, you can think about um, any number of different ways that Vermonters would be able to, uh, to, to access and get some help and support for uh, heating efficiency, for, uh, for cooling efficiency, for, for transportation efficiency. Um, and so one of the things that we have noticed as we've tried to put incentives out there, for instance, to help folks uh, shift from a, a, a gasoline powered vehicle to an electric vehicle is that the, the rebate that you are eligible for depends uh, a lot on the, the electric utility that you, you know, where your home is located. And, you know, if you go to a car dealership in South Burlington, but like me, you live in Bradford, you know, that, that dealership has no idea really how to help you uh, understand the full financial picture and, and what you might be able to get for incentives or uh, for, for charging um, your electric vehicle. And so really looking at the idea of centralizing some of these activities uh, around one utility, um, the Efficiency Vermont type uh, model, where we could really, you know, we have a trusted brand name there who has already helped us learn how to uh, access electric efficiency for our homes. And, and um, so what you're really talking about there is, is um, legislation that, that's contained in S337, uh, which passed out of the Senate and came over to the House uh, really towards the end of May. Um, and at that point, we were in full, um, you know, COVID relief fund response. So the House committees uh, did not have a chance to take that up um, in, in May and June. Uh, but we're hopeful that they'll come back to that bill, uh, S-337, in the August and September timeframe. Uh, because what it does is that that bill just pushes us a little bit further forward with, uh, with beta testing whether, uh, whether this model would work. And uh, we believe it has a lot of potential to help Vermonters uh, access the kinds of technology that will help them uh, reduce their fossil fuel use so that we're, instead of sending $2 billion a year, right, you know, most of it going out of the state and not staying here to help stimulate our economy, we can keep some of that money in our own pockets because we didn't have to spend it on inefficient fossil fuel uh, heating and transportation, and keep other um, parts of that money in the state because we used it to buy locally sourced electricity. Um, and so this is really about an economic stimulus as well as about saving Vermonters money. Thank you. Uh, you know, as I think about 
the environmental issues, the climate issues, and the historical um, false dichotomy of saying climate or environment versus jobs, uh, I think now is one of those times when we can really highlight how climate crisis legislation, uh, economic development, uh, financial savings for working class Vermonters can be tied together. And we know that COVID-19 has had a devastating impact on our economy. Many Vermonters are still out of work. And we know that uh, unfortunately with the wave happening in the South and the West and who knows what's gonna happen in the fall, this may go on for a while. And I see real opportunities for job creation uh, and expansion in the renewable energy sector, uh, maybe in the weatherization sector, maybe the other sectors to reduce our carbon emissions. And I'm curious if any of you wanna talk about what opportunities you see uh, in both jobs and possibly workforce development that might tie some of these different things together. I think it was alluded to early on by, by one of you, I can't remember which. Um, and I would even say the Vermont State Colleges and technical schools and our high school. How can we overlap some of these different needs that are societal, are job related, are workforce related, and are climate related in ways that we can really propel Vermont forward as we rebuild. Um, you know, I'm up for anybody jumping in. I can think of all kinds of ideas. I already put some of them into that opening, but uh, I don't know, Lauren or Sarah, do you want to start? And uh, we'll get back to Chris. Yeah, I would love to jump in. Um, you know, workforce development in, uh, in, a, in the COVID era, um, I think is it, we've got some really intriguing new skills that we've all um, had to learn here by virtue of the fact that, that we were in a stay home, stay safe order for so long. You know, there are, are a lot of folks who are not only accessing their college coursework uh, or their technical school coursework online, um, but they're also learning how to, uh, how to do their relicensure and recertification in a remote way. Um, and, and the opportunities that that brings to us really is that we can, we can be looking at um, moving forward on green certification for, um, for many of our uh, existing, you know, plumbers, electricians, architects, um, you know, real estate appraisers and realtors, all of those uh, professions uh, will, you know, will have, through COVID have um, had the opportunity to learn how to do their recertification online. And, and that really opens up the possibility that we can get a base level of, um, you know, uh, green certification training out to these different professions. Um, and then I think about, you know, the young people who are coming out of high school and trying to figure out, you know, what does, what does life look like <laughs> in a COVID world? And, you know, if, if I have the opportunity to choose whether to go to four-year college and, uh, and I'm going to be online, maybe I should look at, you know, a two-year technical training program and then jump in to get one of those solar installation jobs that, um, that is uh, increasingly prevalent here in Vermont. And so, you know, we certainly hope that these, um, these challenges that have been put in front of us in terms of COVID are also going to be seen as opportunities for, um, for uh, not only existing professionals in the workforce, but young people who are joining the workforce to, uh, to access that training in, uh, in a different way. Great. Either of you others uh, wanna chime in a little on this? I can jump in uh, briefly. One area that we've been focusing on is really trying to connect with our federal delegation, knowing that to make the kinds of investments that we want to make in a green economy, you know, it would obviously be a game changer if we can get federal stimulus money, federal infrastructure money that could be put to these efforts. And we were looking, um, for example, at what happened after the 2008 financial crisis and the um, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act and in Vermont, there was this great story around weatherization where money came in kind of an unprecedented level. People were able to get trained. These were good paying jobs. They were focusing um, on weatherizing low income people's homes. Um, so you're helping save those families then on their monthly um, heating bills. 
So it was this kind of win-win story and a real success. So we've been trying to bring those kinds of stories and examples, you know, and some lessons learned of, you know, what made it hard to get some of that money on the ground to see how can we uh, really invest in, in training and these kinds of programs that, um, that already exist and how can we ramp up some of these, these programs uh, just with, you know, more money we could get, get those programs out to more people, train more people to be working in them. Um, so that's been a big area of focus. And, and I think part of that, I, I saw a question about clean water, you know, which I think is also tied in. I know there's a lot of talk right now federally about a big clean water infrastructure bill. And we have so much work with our local water infrastructure and building that out as climate resilient with, you know, right-sized culverts and, and all of that. I think is also a huge um, area of potential job growth of how we're, you know, doing the work that we need to do to, to clean up um, our waters and reduce pollution from our roads and um, on and on. So I think there's, there's a lot of opportunity there and it can be both clean water and climate resilience. Yeah, I know, Chris, you've uh, worked for Bernie Sanders before. I know you and I both really value the, the connection around economic injustice and the range of other injustices, but relating to economic and climate injustice, you know, piggybacking on what Lauren just talked about, the potential for uh, jobs out of high school that pay decently or financial savings for, uh, as Lauren said, working class folks getting their homes weatherized or seniors on fixed incomes being able to stay in their homes. Do you see potential there for, you know, kind of a, a multi-pronged benefit from investments in these areas? Absolutely, I do. And, and you know, weatherization, uh, as an example, you're never exporting that job, right? You're never going to have somebody from overseas coming to weatherize your home. That has got to be a Vermont job, a local job, and it has been a good paying job. Uh, I, I, I think that when we look at infrastructure questions, and we talk about rebuilding the economy, we talk about the federal infrastructure stimulus, one of the things that jumps to mind is broadband. Uh, we need broadband still in many rural areas of the state, actually in Chittenden County as well. Um, and that is an infrastructure that has a deep impact on the potential for a more sustainable future when you look at people not commuting to work every day. Uh, so so there, there are examples over and over and over where we can pair infrastructure needs, response from the COVID pandemic, and climate. Uh, we mentioned local ag earlier. That's another clear example where, you know, the climate benefit is sort of at the end of the, the, the discussion in a way, but, um, you know, building our soil. As a, you talk about water quality, one of the best ways we can clean up our waterways is uh, building soil so that our soil absorbs water slows it down and, and less of the pollution runs off. That's good for water quality and it's good for farm uh, infrastructure because they're likely to have, if you have stronger soils, better crop outcomes. So there, there are so many connections that are opportunities uh, that also will have climate benefits that, that it's, it's exciting, it's a big challenge. So we're not always great at connecting those dots in state government, we have to do a better job of that. Yeah, I'm gonna, um, we're going to get into wrapping up around uh, what future pending legislation might be possible and that we could work on going forward, whether it's August, September, or more likely in January. But before I go to that wrapping up question, I want to bring in uh, two questions that were asked. One, um, I know my guests have seen some of it in the chat and have touched on water quality in some different areas. And Lauren talked about the PFAS contam contamination. But we have two questions that have come in on Facebook, one around water quality and how can we continue to work towards progress on that. And Lauren, you touched on federal money and uh, PFAS and, um, you know, I, if anybody wants to address cyanobacteria blooms or coronavirus and wastewater, if we know much about that particular one, you can touch on it. I'm going to briefly answer the second question, which has to do with um, ticks and uh, climate change and um, sort of what what is the um, climate connection to tick increases in tick-borne illness? And, and I happen to be relatively connected to that, unfortunately. My spouse has Lyme disease and other tick-borne illnesses. Thankfully, most of those other ones we've been able to address. But um, 
there's no doubt that with the climate crisis, various new illnesses, whether they're ticks and tick-borne illnesses, where the tick populations are growing and moving to the north, uh, now reaching all the way to Canada and starting to expand into the, into the Canadian provinces. Uh, and really, Vermont is one of the top, unfortunately, tick-borne illness states in the country, uh, which is something that I think we could look into. Uh, I actually proposed to the governor three years ago that we work together to endow a chair at the UVM Medical Center to look at tick-borne illness, uh, infectious disease, and what we can do about it to work in concert with uh, both Stanford University and Johns Hopkins, which are top medical research institutions. So we can sometimes take these challenges and also turn them into opportunities to really put Vermont and then other both jobs on the map in the research field, but also hopefully find solutions for these illnesses uh, to help Vermonters. Because last I checked, and I brought this up for the governor, the ticks don't happen to care what our political beliefs are. They just want our blood. And in getting our blood, they uh, infect Vermonters across the board from line workers to tourists to farmers and foresters to uh, tourism guides and so forth. So uh, this is an issue that we need to take on uh, for sure, uh, Barbara. And unfortunately, there's no easy solution. Uh, but I think as we address the climate crisis and try to reduce the warming, which of course, I think we're all very familiar with this summer as it's been outrageously hot and dry, I can tell you as a farmer, uh, we need to be tackling these things. Uh, I don't know whether uh, someone else has information about coronavirus and wastewater. Um, I know there's a lot of research going on into that. And so if anybody has a, a bit they want to add on that, um, and or cyanobacteria blooms, I know um, Senator Pearson, you're on agriculture. And I know agriculture has been doing a lot to shift and work towards reducing runoff. Urban areas are having a harder time with the combined sewer issues. Do, does anybody want to touch on either of those uh, with your knowledge or um, we could also work to gain more information and get back to uh, Kai on that, who, who wrote that question. Sure. Well, the, the um, water quality continues to be a priority. I mean, we have in our state a number of deferred uh, maintenance. Uh, water quality is, is a very high level one. I would say our response to emissions reduction is another one. Um, but then we have the state colleges, uh, David, you mentioned earlier, on and on and on and on. These are things that, frankly, Montpelier has not been aggressively addressing for many years, and now it's reaching crisis. We continue to uh, take the water quality challenge very seriously. The EPA is watching us very closely. We have regular annual and, and periodic check-ins to make sure that we're making the investments necessary. Agricultural practices have changed dramatically on dairy farms in the last several years uh, as they attempt to do their part. Uh, but there is more to do. Uh, we're seeing soil uh, quality uh, um, and, and healthy soil as one of the strategies. And in fact, just in the miscellaneous ag bill, we re-upped this working group made up of dairy farmers and other water quality experts who are looking at how to invest in so-called ecosystem payment services. So don't just pay farmers for milk, but also pay them for building soil in a way that we acknowledge uh, helps sequester carbon, helps uh, deal with flood mitigation and reduce runoff. Um, the, the towns and paved lots and runoff that comes from there, that's the next chapter that, that more and more people are focusing on and is going to be very difficult. It's going to be expensive. We're going to parlay federal money uh, to do that. But the idea that we're not looking closely at, at blooms and water quality is, is not fair. We continue to make investments. We have in the last few years put together sustainable funding packages going forward. And this remains a priority. That said, it was kind of neglected for a long time. So it's not going to turn around quickly. Uh, but, but there are promising signs that we're moving in the right direction. I can just jump in briefly. Um, so, you know, I, I do think that there's a lot of credit from recent years between new policies and finally last year, the legislature putting in place a long-term funding package um, so that there's actually, um, you know, revenue more in line with what we know we need to address the problem. So that's all really encouraging. I do just, you know, 
urge people to keep watching, knowing that there's these huge budget challenges. And we've already seen a little bit of proposals from the Scott administration to pare down the clean water budget. Um, and we've seen a kind of start of a process to maybe backpedal on one of the important stormwater regulations having to do with large, um, large developments, like a big parking lot. Um, there was just a letter from the EPA I saw last week saying, you know, essentially like state of Vermont, like you need to put this regulation in place on the timeline you said, or you're not meeting your EPA commitment. So I think there, you know, we need to just stay, stay diligent about, you know, watching what is happening to make sure we do stay on track because there's been a lot of good pieces put in place, as Chris said, you know, it's going to be years of, of work that we need to do. So we need to really stay vigilant and, um, and stay on top of it to ensure that we kind of maintain the, the commitment we've made in recent years. Thank you. As we near the end of this conversation, uh, I want to wrap up by talking about the future. Uh, this has been a great panel discussing both what we've done and, of course, as we talk about the climate crisis, we talk about water quality. Uh, if we don't have a vision for the future and, uh, and how to get there, uh, then we're really going to come up short. We know that we have to tackle these issues and grab the bulls by the horns. Uh, so I'm curious uh, what legislation is, you know, on the wall or uh, hopefully pending that Vermonters might want to stay active on or might want the legislature to stay active on with respect to climate issues, water quality, and, and what can people do to help ensure policies do move forward? Uh, you know, we've got three of the, the most um, outspoken leaders on climate and environmental issues on this panel. Uh, Lauren represents numerous groups that are working towards a climate uh, and environmental future that is inclusive of you know, economic and racial injustice is issues from the past. And you've got the two co-chairs, uh, Sarah and Chris, of the Climate Solutions Caucus. So you've got the Global Warming Solutions Act just about through. Uh, we've been talking about renewable energy. How do people um, stay active, stay involved, and help you help your colleagues and the rest of the legislature and future administrations and the present administration uh, move forward with a strong agenda? That's a great question that I would love to jump in and answer yeah. for a moment. Um, you know, Chris and I took over as co-chairs of the Climate Solutions Caucus a little over a year ago now. Um, and we really, um, at that moment, uh, came to the realization that if we want to be able to move forward with climate legislation in Vermont, we really need to be able to get out there and engage with Vermonters in the community. Um, you know, the, the moneyed interests in keeping us uh, dependent on a fossil fuel economy do a really good job, frankly, of undermining the advances that we are trying to move forward and, uh, and try their very best uh, through all sorts of nefarious um, activities to, uh, to, to convince people that, that, you know, fossil fuels is the way it needs to be and anybody who says otherwise is crazy. <laughs> so we've spent a lot of time um, developing relationships out in Vermont communities. And one of the ways that folks can stay in touch with what we're doing um, is to go to the Vermont Climate Solutions Caucus webpage. And there you can get weekly updates uh, during the legislative session. Um, and you can also see links to progress on the bills that are currently in place. And you know, the this whole global pandemic has uh, has has sort of rocked our focus and rocked our foundation. Um, but it has left us feeling um, all the more resolved that if we don't proactively act on climate and act <laughs> aggressively, we may not be able to. Um, ever get ahead of it because we'll always be in reactive mode. And so I think it's super important for Vermonters to stay involved um, in, in speaking with their uh, legislators, in speaking with uh, governor and lieutenant governor candidates, uh, really talking about the importance of uh, acting on climate. And uh, if you want to be able to get in touch with us, you can certainly uh, get in touch with us through our Climate Caucus um, website. And then hopefully at some point in the future, Chris and I will be able to do another Roadshow uh, series like we did last year, where we met with over a thousand Vermonters in, in uh, you know, 20 or 30 different communities around the state. 
Um, but for now, we'll do this virtually and, and um, take a peek at our website and get in touch with us if you, um, if you want to get involved. Chris, can you uh, offer that website up verbally for the Facebook viewers sure. and uh, maybe talk about what you see out there? Yeah, and we also have a, a Facebook page. Uh, VTClimateCaucus.org is the website. Uh, and Sarah's absolutely right. There, there are candidates crawling all over the state or virtually campaigning all over the state. Ask every one of them uh, to make climate a priority and uh, to put Vermont uh, on a strong economic sustainable path forward. Uh, we really need your help. The outreach from constituents has made all the difference in the last year. Uh, as, as we all watched pre-COVID, we watched uh, California burn, we watched Australia burning, we've seen record floods and storms, we've seen storming in the flooding in the Midwest, uh, on and on and on. You mentioned ticks. There are so many examples of the climate crisis, but it doesn't ever feel uh, enough urgency in Montpelier. And the outreach from Vermonters to lawmakers has made a huge difference. We're seeing uh, the impact there and, and people please keep going because we need. Great, and uh, Lauren, what do you, uh, you wanna see in the future as you are working with these different organizations and, and helping citizens find their voice and use their voice and you help amplify that voice. Yeah, I mean, I would just echo, I mean, at this moment, reaching out to candidates can make such a difference. I mean, we really see at the start of a new session, what people have heard on the campaign trail really shapes what the feeling is of what are the issues we really have to prioritize. You know, there's, and there's gonna be so many competing priorities with this, you know, really challenging moment we're in. So making sure that this is one of the issues that's front and center for people. Um, people can check out, we do an environmental scorecard. So at the vermontconservationvoters.org website, you can find it and it, it really just helps kind of give you a sense of how people are showing up. You know, almost nobody in Vermont campaigns on like pro pollution, you know, anti climate action. A lot of people have some good rhetoric, but when push comes to shove and you're having to vote on, you know, do you want to actually put money towards something? Do you actually, you know, support a new regulation? Uh, that's where you can start to see the difference. So you can check that out to get a sense of your local, um, at least the incumbents uh, who have a record. And, you know, that's a great way to start a conversation with them of, you know, thanks for supporting this if you did and keep it up. It's really important. Or, you know, I really hope next time you're going to vote for, for climate action, clean water, and other priorities. Um, so that's another resource for people to, to check out. Excellent. Uh, well, I wanna um, state as they have that it's election season. So reach out to all of us, reach out to all the other people that are running for office from across the political spectrum. Uh, early voting has started. So you can uh, request a ballot from your city clerk, town clerk, uh, anytime, mail in the postcard you got or call up your clerk and you can vote and get it back in after maybe you've had these conversations with any one of us or any of uh, your candidates in your part of the state, uh, which I guess for me is everybody, but for Sarah and the Senator Pearson are, are more geographically defined areas. Uh, and before I thank my guests, I'm going to embarrass one of them and say happy birthday. Uh, we are in the birthday few days of uh, Representative Sarah Copenhansis. So um, if you're one of her constituents or you know her from work around the state house, give her a shout out uh, at some point here. And I wanna thank uh, Senator, Senator Pearson, uh, Representative Sarah Copenhansis, uh, who are co-chairs of the Climate Solutions Caucus, and Lauren Hurl, uh, the Executive Director of the Vermont Conservation Voters uh, for joining us today and really um, helping us understand and uh, helping you hopefully have more information to be able to talk to uh, the various candidates and legislators and remind you that if you have any questions or ideas that you want to share about climate legislation, environmental legislation, any other legislation or issue, uh, feel free to reach out to info at Zuckerman4VT.com and that's Zuckerman which is Z-U-C-K-E-R-M-A-N-F-O-R-V-T.com and I can get those questions to the others if uh, it's specific to one of them uh, and uh, again I want to thank you all. Um, I want to take a moment, since this is a climate and environmental discussion, 
to also thank the folks from Rights and Democracy Vermont and Sierra Club Vermont who have endorsed me in this election uh, for Lieutenant, excuse me, as Lieutenant Governor for Governor. Um, and hopefully you'll take a look at uh, like all the candidates and push us all to be stronger on these issues so that we can hit the ground running as Lauren talked about in January uh, to push a climate and environmental and economic development package uh, for our future. So thank you to all three of you for joining us. I really appreciate it. Thank you for your leadership on these issues, Dave, very much.